I'd now like to introduce our keynote speaker, Deborah Jarvis. Deborah was a chaplain at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance for many years, and interestingly, uh, while there, she had the chance to counsel a sacral chordoma patient. Um, Deborah has written numerous books, and in the past few years, given a, a TED talk about what she's learned from cancer patients she has worked with, as well as being a cancer patient herself. And we're very fortunate to have her with us today. So I'd like to welcome Deborah. Good morning. I'm happy as a French fry, as a French fry. I'm happy as a bird with a French fry to be here. <laughs> I've spoken at a lot of cancer conferences. And I just have to open by saying that this is the first one that felt like a family reunion to me. It's really extraordinary. Um, my husband is a scientist, so I've gone to a lot of scientific conferences. I've gone to a lot of patient conferences. But having a conference where you have patients and researchers together is an amazing thing. And I applaud you all. It creates a passion and a commitment that I have never experienced. So good on you. I want to give you some scenarios. You're in love. And your lover looks at you and says, I love you with all of my heart. I've never met anyone like you. You're one in a million. Your boss calls you into her office and says, I am giving you a raise. Your work is outstanding. You're one in a million. The score is tied. It's the bottom of the ninth. Bases are loaded. Two outs. You're up to bat. You hit a home run and your teammates go crazy shouting and screaming, dude, you are one in a million. These are all great scenarios to be one in a million. The only time you don't want to hear that is when you're in your doctor's office and he or she is saying, you have this really rare cancer, chordoma, and it's one in a million. This is how I knew how rare chordoma is. When I was writing up this talk, Microsoft Word kept suggesting Cordoba or charwoman. <laughs> Even my email flagged it, like, what is this? This is a typo. You better check. Thank you for inviting me to speak here this morning. I was kind of actually looking forward to a big, ugly snowstorm, because that's always been on my bucket list, because I'm from the West Coast. so. But <clears throat> that's OK. I'm going to talk about some things this morning that if you just wandered in here hoping for a free cup of coffee, these things will pertain to you. I'm going to talk about things that I hope all of you will be talking about at the Seder dinner or the Easter egg hunt or graduation, or a wedding, or 4th of July, or if you're really bold, a cocktail party. So I'm going to talk about finding meaning, spirituality, and death. Now, I'm going to start with my favorite subject. It's not spirituality, just because I'm a chaplain. It's not spirituality. It's death. Why am I going to start with that? Well, because it's harder to leave a talk at the very beginning. And if you leave now, everyone will notice. If I put death at the end and then you leave, everyone will just think you have to pee. So we're going to start there. Death is hard to talk about because it brings up hard emotions. And we are so adverse to hard emotions. 
It's very, very difficult. But I feel fine bringing up death with you because I know that every single person in here who got a diagnosis of cancer thought about death. So I'm not bringing up anything that you haven't already thought about. Because I know that when you got that diagnosis, you heard cancer, you thought death. Malignant, death. Suspicious, death. So I'm not bringing up anything you haven't thought of. But I just want to assure you that talking about death does not bring it on. I tell you, if talking about something brought it on, I would have lost 10 pounds a long time ago. So no worries about that. But I suspect, like you, I was raised to not speak of it. As if, you know, the Grim Reaper's under the bed, and if you say the word, he'll pop out. Say, here I am. Now, perhaps you're thinking, death. We don't want to hear about that. We need inspiration. We need encouragement. We need hope. Have you ever even met a Cordoma patient? Yes, I have. I even wrote an as yet unpublished book about her. She was one of my hospice patients. And I'm going to call her Pammy, and I'm going to tell her, tell you about her. She was a teeny tiny Vietnamese woman with a perfectly cut black page boy and an enormous smile. She was married to a wonderful guy, and she had an adorable son I'll call Paul, who was four years old when I met her in hospice. Many of you probably know that when you go into a hospice program, that's because your doctor thinks you've got about six months or less to live. Pammy lived in the hospice program for five years five years in the hospice program. We kept thinking, this is the end, but she persisted. She was one of the most courageous people I've ever met. She told me that she escaped Vietnam. She tried to escape five times. She escaped on the sixth time by joining a group of women who pretended they were a singing group and they were gonna go entertain the troops. And I said to her, oh my God, weren't you terrified you'd be shot and tortured? And, and she said, no, I was terrified I'd be asked to sing. <laughs> and the way that she finally got out of Vietnam, she concealed herself behind a cow that was pulling a wagon. And then she ran over the Cambodian border into a Red Cross hospital. That's how she managed. So you get a picture of what she was like. Now, our American culture has failed us as far as being comfortable talking about death. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to think about it. We don't like to actually do it. But, you know, we need to get friendly with it because I can say pretty much 100% of us in this room are going to die. That's just the word. Although, Somebody at dinner last night told me that her husband truly believes he's never going to die. Really? I don't know if you were at my table and heard that, but he thinks that science is going to come up with something, but, and he's like in his 40s. I'm like, dude, that's going to have to happen pretty soon, because who knows? Anyway, um, the thing is, we have to understand that the party's not going to last forever, so we don't want to waste a moment. Now, like I said, this is one of my favorite subjects, death, but for years, it was a conversation stopper. So I would be really excited about it and be at a dinner party and I'd lean across the table and I'd say to the person across from me, so, like, how do you want to die? It would totally stop the conversation. Everybody would freeze or people would start taking another big gulp of wine. And then my darling husband, who would be trying to save me from this moment, would start talking about his work, infectious disease and parasites. So for a while there, we just didn't get invited out anywhere. Um, I'm happy to say 
I think things are a little better now, and it's almost becoming hip to talk about death. You know, there's death with dignity, there's death cafes, there's death salons, there's green burial. Everyone's talking about this. And I think it's because the baby boomers are really aging and dying and taking care of their elderly parents. So it's like, yeah, this is on my agenda. Um, but in the early 2000s, when I was working at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, it was different. And at that time, the nurses came to me and they said, you know, we're really uncomfortable talking to our patients about terminal illness and death and spirituality. And I knew that until they explored their own feelings and beliefs around death and dying, they could never talk to their patients about it. So I created this program called the Existential Expedition, right? Because we don't want to sound religious because this is Washington State. God forbid. And the first session, we talked about childhood dreams. What did you want to be when you grew up? And what called you to do the work you're doing now? And the totally cool thing was that the administration was very behind this program. So they gave each nurse, it was a three-week program, two hours out of their day to be in this group where we would discuss these things. So that was really cool. So we kind of started sort of superficial, talk about, you know, what were your family beliefs around pain and suffering, that kind of thing. And then the next week we talked about spirituality. What were you raised to believe and what do you believe now? And it was just super shocking for some people to realize, oh my gosh, I don't even believe that now. They just never really thought about it. So in fact, you know, spirituality, it's another thing that's hard for our culture. I noticed in that slide about survivorship, they didn't say spirituality, they said psychosocial issues. I thought, okay, yeah, we're still working on it. Um, so, of course, the last session we save the best for last, and we talked about death. And the questions were, where do you think we go? Do you think cancer is the worst kind of death? Uh, if you had to die right now, how would you want to die? And I gave them lots of choices because I knew that, you know, people don't think about this. So, you know, I was like, shark attack, car accident, murder, house fire, drowning, snake bite, poison mushrooms, you know. Here's the surprising thing. Over 40 nurses went through this program. 80% of them chose cancer as how they would like to die. 80%. And the reasons were that it gives you time to say goodbye. I love you. I forgive you. Forgive me. Where's my Tupperware bowl? This actually came up. Um, it gives your family time to get used to the fact that you're going to die. There were people in that group that said, you know, my brother died suddenly and it took me a year to get that he was really gone. I kept going out to the mailbox looking for a postcard. And after a year, then I began to grieve. So that was really interesting. Now, if you're wondering about the 20%, you can imagine, right? They want to die in their sleep, but with the fridge full, the house clean, and the laundry done. <laughs> and these were mostly female nurses. Uh, no one chose death by a murder or you know, car accident. That's just too violent. And house fire, um, too painful. Drowning, too scary. Poison mushrooms, just kind of too embarrassing. So. Now, as far as what happens after you get out of your body, well, there were all kinds of ideas floating around. There was the heaven and hell thing, which for me personally, it just doesn't resonate with me. But there were some people that were like, I'm really liking that. Some people suggested, well, what about, you know, this concept of ocean waves? So you go to the beach and you see this wave coming, you take a picture of the wave, 
You come back the next day, here's your picture of the wave, but where's that wave? It's the whole ocean. So that was kind of a popular idea. Or, you know, this Buddhist idea that you come here and you need to learn something, and if you don't learn it, you get to come back and try again. Or what if we're backstage saying to one another, oh my God, you were so good as the overbearing mother. Or oh, you were the pissy checkout guy, that was fantastic. So, you know, what if we're like playing parts? I don't know, there were lots of ideas. The important thing is that we were all talking about it. Because when you talk about something you fear, it loses so much of its power. It's when you don't talk about it that it grows. For Pammy, fear of death was the least of her problems. She had no fear of death because she was a devout Catholic and she believed that she was going to heaven. So we're done with that. That's what she believed. Which brings me to spirituality. I can't tell you the number of times I've heard people say, I'm spiritual, not religious, which I'm all for. Because I think by the very fact that you showed up on the planet as a human being, you're a spiritual being. And it doesn't matter if you go to a church or not. And I think that everybody can get comfortable talking about their spirituality, but you know, as many of us know, it's, it's difficult to talk about spiritual experience. It's like we don't have the vocabulary. So I think that's why art and music and poetry are often the languages of spirituality. So like I was saying, just because you don't belong to a particular religion doesn't mean you don't have a spiritual life. Um, the, the original meaning of the word religion wasn't such a negative one as it is today. It, it comes from the Latin religio, which refers to the cord that binds a bundle of sticks. So I love that idea. You know, what is it that binds your life together? What, what holds your sticks together? I, so that's your religion. So don't, you know, don't think about church and, and that kind of thing. I think religion is just a basket that we carry our spiritual beliefs in. So, <clears throat> excuse me, you could have a Buddhist basket or a Christian basket or an agnostic basket. Don't get hooked on the basket, because when you look inside, you see that the contents are almost all the same. It's about love and compassion and forgiveness and service and mercy. All of the major world religions are saying the same thing. Spiritual contents involves life's meaning. You know, how you nourish your life, how you how you experience it, how you view it, your perspective on it. So, if you showed up as a human, you're a spiritual being. Now, I wanna to get to meaning. Perhaps this is the moment you've been waiting for, the meaning of life. Here's the truth. Life is meaningless. It's meaningless. Things happen and it's all meaningless until we decide what it means for each of us. When I was in high school, I was required to read Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. And many of you may know this book. It's really well known. The whole gist of this book is that we can choose our attitude in any given set of circumstances. So it's about how these men in a concentration camp, despite unspeakable brutality, managed to find meaning and purpose and even a small measure of happiness while they were there. That's pretty mind blowing. Then I read that book again as an adult, and I got another truth from the book, which is that just living 
causes suffering. You show up on the planet and you live. Nobody gets through life without some pain. Nobody. The challenge is that we have to find meaning or purpose in our suffering. And here's the hard part. No one can tell us what that means for us. That's up to each one of us. And what it means today can mean something totally different two years from now. So here is how Pammy found meaning in her life. All she wanted was one more day to raise her son. She would pray every day, I want one more day. From the time I knew her in hospice, she got 1,825 days with her son. Not every day was a blast full of light and joy. She had a lot of pain that easily could have been controlled with medication, but she deeply believed that A, pain meds would make her die more quickly, B, she wouldn't be clear for her son, and most importantly, she deeply believed that every time she endured a pain crisis, she was releasing one soul out of purgatory. That was her belief. Now, you can imagine, this was very, very disturbing to the hospice team. We do not want you to feel pain. They said to me, that's crazy. The Catholic Church doesn't even believe that anymore. You gotta go in there, you gotta talk her out of that belief. And I said, you know, my job is not to talk anybody out of anything. This is what gives meaning and purpose to her life. This makes her pain redemptive. Each one of us gets to decide what our experience means. And that's what she decided. But then what happens when we find ourselves in a place where we don't even know what's happening, let alone what it means. So, for example, we're waiting for test results. We're waiting for a diagnosis. We're waiting for a treatment plan. I call that the no clue zone, right? You have no, you have no clue. If you want to get all sophisticated about it, it's also called liminality. You're neither here nor there. You're betwixt in between, you're on the threshold, you're in this space where you know your life will never be the same, but you don't know exactly how it's going to change. And that can be a very uncomfortable place to be. However, here's the thing, the no clue zone, the liminal space, that can be a place of transformation really a place of transformation, but you may not know it at the time. It just, you just may be impatient and you want to get to the next step and you're afraid. And the problem with fear is that it can immobilize us and it makes us contract and it makes our worlds very, very small. Fear can make us feel vulnerable and scared and cold inside, right? People often say, I was frozen with fear. I felt a cold fear. It's never a hot fear, right? Anger's hot, but fear is cold. I felt an icy fear. And that is why we love to hunker down in what I call the hoodie of fear. Now I'm gonna guess that almost everybody in this room has a hoodie. I have several. I almost brought it today as a prop, but I thought, no, they're not babies. They know what a hoodie is. So here's the thing. We get really afraid, and then we put on a hoodie, we zip it up, we put the hood on, and then we just hunker down in the corner. We don't want to move. We're immobilized. And the problem with that is that when you have that hood up, you can't see very well. You're field of vision gets very narrow and you can't hear very well because you've got this hood covering your ears. 
And people can't see you very well because you've got this hood over your face. So we're in that place of liminality and that's the temptation. But I want you to consider for a moment the Wizard of Oz, the story of the Wizard of Oz and Dorothy. That was a liminal journey. She was neither here nor there. She wasn't in Kansas. She wasn't in Oz. She was on the Yellow Brook Road. And she didn't put on a hoodie and hunker down by the side of the road clutching Toto. I mean, she got out there and moved forward. And who helped her on her journey? Courage or courage, intelligence and love. The lion, the scarecrow, the tin man. So yes, we may be in a place of unknowing, but let's enter that unknown space and time with courage, intelligence, and love rather than dread and fear. So instead of contracting, we expand and we walk forward with our hands out like this with an attitude of curiosity, you know, leaving behind all of our assumptions and expectations and asking ourselves, hmm, I wonder what's gonna happen. I wonder how this will affect my family. I wonder who I'll become. Because when you approach anything with an attitude of curiosity, it suddenly becomes more interesting and less intimidating. And the other thing is, if there are any gifts to be found in this very hard experience, when you're walking forward like this, you're ready to receive them. Because when you're like that, you can't see anything. In the Zen practice, I'm sure you've heard this, this is called beginner's mind. You go very open to what there is, and you're alert to what there is in it for you. So, one thing you do know is that no matter what, being in this liminal space will change you. Whether it's a benign tumor, a malignant tumor, or just fuzz on the lens, you will never be the same person. Because being in that space, that no clue zone, it makes us explore our own beliefs about life. And that's always a good thing. That's always a good thing. A truly significant change to your world almost always requires some kind of corresponding change in yourself. And the scarier it is, the greater potential for growth. Now, I know that there are many people in here, because I've met you and I've talked to you, who are already pretty awake. And maybe you're thinking, yeah, okay, you know, I already get that, that life is short. And we shouldn't waste our time focusing on the superficial or holding a grudge or trying to get more stuff or whatever. So what I want to close with this morning is that if we're awake, don't go back to sleep. And it's very easy to do that. Several years ago, I had a chemo patient who had a really hard time with side effects. They just couldn't seem to get her nausea under control. She was having GI issues. And her daughter was pregnant at the time. And this woman said to me, I want to be involved. I want to live for that baby. I want to take care of him. And I want him to know who his Grammy is. I want to be involved. And then she went on to say that she got the fact that she wasn't going to live forever, so she wasn't going to work so damn hard, and she wasn't going to be so critical and judgmental. And she said, I want to work in my garden. I want to feel the dirt between my fingers. I know what's important. And I thought, wow, you know, good for you, because those are really profound insights. About three years later, I ran into her in the grocery store. Now, I wish I could tell you I was standing in the organic produce section, 
but I was not. I was standing at the cheese case, and I had a big wheel of brie in one hand, and then a wheel of camembert in the other hand. And, you know, I was kind of standing there lost in thought, going, God, you know, which one do we like? What's the difference? Is one softer? Is one stronger? You know how you're just kind of standing there? And this voice behind me goes, you eat that, and that'll chunk up your thighs. I mean, them's fighting words, right? I turned around, and it's her. And she starts laughing, and I said, oh my gosh, look at you. She looked fabulous. She had perfect hair. She had great jewelry. She had a beautiful manicure. I said, oh, it's so good to see you. You must be having a blast with your grandson. And she said, he's a little monster. <laughs> Thank God they put him in daycare. I said, oh, well, you must be having a great time with your garden. How's that going? And she said, honey, look at these nails. You think I want to ruin these nails? I don't think so. And I'm back in real estate, and I'm working very hard because the market is flat. So, no. And I thought, oh, no. You went back to sleep. And I wanted to remind her how she wanted to be involved in her grandson's life and dig in the dirt and feel earth between her fingers and how she wasn't going to be so critical and judgmental. And I'm thinking all these things and I'm holding this wheel of brie and this wheel and cam and bear and just standing there. And before I could say a word, she said, and Deborah, I have to tell you, you can't afford to put on any more weight. So I just smiled and put them both in my basket. If we've learned to appreciate every moment, if we really get that life is short, live for today because we don't have tomorrow. If we really get we're all going to die, we must not go back to sleep. We have to stay awake and be curious and cultivate an attitude of wonder. And we have to find meaning in our experience ourselves, no matter how difficult it is. And we don't need to have cancer for spiritual and personal growth. But if we're touched by it, let's use it. Let's explore. Let's explore our beliefs around death, around life, so that we can live more fully. Let's find meaning. Let's become open and curious about the unknown. And let's not go back to sleep. Thank you. Okay.